Hey everyone, Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. Ultimate Alien began with a lot of expectations that so far has fluctuated wildly with its success. On one hand, with Ben's new world-famous celebrity status, each episode gets to play with that concept and uses a lot of unique executions with that type of story. So I'd say that story change was a success. On the other hand, we're given the subtitle Ultimate Alien, with countless advertisements talking about all the new aliens Ben would get, all of the old aliens he would receive, and the new Ultimates feature. But overall, none of that really seems to matter. And it's pretty disappointing that a show called Ultimate Alien gives the actual Ultimates concept the third wheel. But between the highs and lows, what ties it all together is the story arc, which is Greg's quest to recapture the five missing Andromeda aliens so he can absorb their power. Greg feels like a balance between a classic series and an Alien Force villain. He's classic in a sense that he exists to be an opposing, power-hungry force against the main trio. But he's Alien Force in a sense that he has an overarching story to blend together all of his episodes. But he also doesn't quite feel like either of them. Ultimate Greg's Saga is the beginning of Ultimate Alien and Omniverse's trend to introduce the concept of a story arc, but still lacks the full support it needs to truly feel like a well-thought-out, long-form story. Personally, I have a lot of positive thoughts on Ultimate Greg, but he still feels like the weaker end of the villain pool. But this episode is the first major turning point in his story, where he succeeds in step one of his plan and becomes his ultimate form. So let's take a look at the season 1 finale of Ultimate Alien. If this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below, along with a link to all my previous breakdowns, but by all means watch this one first, I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. Season 1 ends with the episode Ultimate Agrigore, which first premiered October 10th, 2010, written by Dwayne McDuffie. Greg has successfully recaptured all five Andromeda aliens and makes his way to Osmos 5 to absorb their powers. But his ship is shot down after a failed ambush by the plumbers, straining him on Earth. He uses Paradox's old portal in Lost Soledad as a power source to jury-rig his machine to still continue his plan, where the main trio are joined by Max in a fight to end Ultimate Greg's efforts. <laughs> See, whenever I see someone tied up in the show, this is the kind of thing I feel like would be more believable than just ropes and stuff. All villains should be getting their hands on this kind of tech. Yeah, you know, with his spear, his ship, his agrobots, this capture device, and as we'll see later, the energetic machine and the headbands, I didn't realize how much Greg was reliant on technology before becoming ultimate. This is the plumbers. Raise your primary manipulation organs into the air. I like how inclusive about their appendages they're trying to be. Also, the plumbers got teleportation technology. Gwen teleported earlier this season. And then even the knights were able to teleport. I guess it's just commonplace now. But they all have that standard plumber rifle we've been seeing. These guys all got a pistol. I don't think we've seen this kind of pistol before. You are surrounded! This guy that teleports in right here. I actually just saw him teleport right here earlier. You think you can assault plumbers and just walk away? And now he's the one speaking on the megaphone. I'm just gonna say this guy's species has cloning abilities. Rain fire. <laughs> Teleportation residue. None of the plumbers left that though. No! Is this guy voiced by Yuri Lowenthal? Fastest course to Osmos 5. So if this Greg bot was able to plot a course to Osmos 5, but in Omniverse we find out it doesn't exist, where would they have gone? <laughs> actually was able to damage his ship. Hyperdrive has been destroyed. Just get me away from here! I think that's the highest pitch we've ever heard Greg speak in. He normally always has a low register and rarely ever raises his voice. He's a he's a pretty calm dude. Acceptable color? He's now a smoothie connoisseur. You gotta pick that up, man. I give the new all-meat smoothies five stars! All-meat smoothie. Would you all try that? I probably would, just out of curiosity. Must be a guy thing, right, Kevin? I'm going back for a blueberry. Your sexism has failed, Ben. You're eating baby food. You want a bottle with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that Ben's able to laugh it off and doesn't just snap back at him. With classic Ben, that easily could have turned into a whole thing. How come we never do this anymore? <laughs> there she is again! Pierce's girlfriend continues her stalking habits. <laughs> And here's the paparazzi. These guys were all ready with cameras. Maybe they were like camping out waiting for the right moment. Now I remember. It does suck that Ben's newfound fame prevents him from just hanging out with his friends like they used to. I think just about every episode of Ultimate Alien so far does elaborate on Ben's new reputation, either showing off a good thing or a bad thing about it. So I like that they're really utilizing this new direction for the show to the fullest. Although in the long run, it didn't feel like him becoming famous is as impactful. But right now within the first season, it does seem to be changing pretty much everything for him. I know I've got a laser cannon in here somewhere. Yeah, murder them. Till I finish this smoothie. So here it's like he's 
activating the ultimatrix just by tapping it. Add that to the list of ways that he's randomly learned how to use it. But we get the hologram appearing without the dial popping up. This is also one of the rare times when Mr. Smoothie Cup's straw isn't red. <laughs> Oh, this is cool. After we zoom into the eye, the new animation starts with Big Chill's face uncloaked, and then it wraps into it. Although the background doesn't scale or slide with him either, which helps to imply that these transformations aren't literally happening. And I love whenever they do a steam effect when he appears. They really keep up with this more than I remember as well. You'd think after like a couple episodes, they'd stop remembering that Big Chill has a cold presence. They even continue the breath on the mouth when he speaks. <laughs> And then Big Chill's wings open. It's very rare we see the wings open without the hood opening as well. And this gives them a different shape. But here we go with Ultimate Big Chill again. Now, so far, he's the ultimate with most appearances by Ben. And we still haven't even seen Ultimate Echo Echo. I guess it's more realistic that there would be an uneven amount of appearances between ultimates. But for, like, the show, I feel like it would have been nice to try to use every ultimate at least once before you get them repeating. Well, it looks like for the ultimate transformation with his head right here, the fire texture assets on his face are behind his head rather than in front. Probably just a layering error though. <laughs> he puts the smoothie down. I know Ultimate Big Chill gets a lot of flack, but I do kind of like the fire turning to ice effect that he has. It doesn't make a lick of sense, but it's still pretty cool. Although, I feel like he could have done this with regular Big Chill. <sighs> And Ultimate Big Chill just fades back to normal Big Chill. Kind of reminds me of Alien Swarm in a way. That's definitely an error. But it also shows off that the shape of his wings changes as well with Ultimate. And not just the colors and patterns. Moment's over. Aw. The mood has been spoiled. And they were having so much fun too. Besides, it's too cold out here. It's a pretty funny gag too. Why is the hologram tinted red? I like that we're seeing the Ultimatrix used as a communicator more. I wouldn't have called you otherwise. It is a school night. Man, I keep forgetting they're still going to school right now. But even so, it's not like they were home or anything. They're all chilling at Mr. Smoothie. They are teenagers. Brought four squads of our best men. Yeah, that's definitely Yuri Lowenthal. I love whenever we see Max in his battle outfit too. Looks like radiation scoring on the debris. Tachyon cannons probably. Tachy on cannon. Isn't that what malware steals in Omniverse? Look at where the sand shines. That's from the transmat beam. So the transmat beam must be a different type of teleportation technology than what the plumbers did because there's not shiny sand anywhere else. I don't understand why they're so shocked though. Like, I feel like it's pretty obvious Kevin is a genius in these areas. I'm sure they're proud of him, but I feel like they should show they're proud more than just being like, wow, Kevin, I can't believe you're not a freaking idiot. It's just that you're, uh, smart. That's gotta hurt to hear for him though. Every time they've ever needed to know anything about alien technology, Kevin's been the one who's in the know. So it makes sense that he'd be able to recognize the results of different types of technology interacting to put together a scene. You got a future in law enforcement. At least he's got Max's support. Is it just me or is he drawn pretty strange here. On one side or another. It's a little bit of foreshadowing there. I shot out his hyperdrive. We could probably track it. Think you can manage not to crash here for five minutes? I don't know. That's like double my record. It's <laughs> a lot of great jokes in this one. Although I feel like the RB3 has autopilot, so they should be good. Never seen you work on anything as hard as you're working on this case. That's bad. Depending on why. Very observant of Gwen. Agrigor is an osmosium. Maybe I just feel responsible. Could that be a Cervantes memory resurfacing? But I do like this whole concept in this scene as well. It's cool that the trio is fighting another Osmosian, but for Kevin to take it personally in a way, adds another layer to the stakes here. This was my dad's badge, now it's mine. Now he has his dad's badge now? I thought he swiped it off of Labrid. Give me the badge you stole. Maybe when he started going through his old stuff, he found his dad's badge and uses it now? I don't know, something like that I feel that we should have seen happen, or else it's just a continuity error. It probably doesn't do any harm to keep an eye on me. Oh, Kevin. Gwen's like... Do I find this hot? As of now, I really do think Kevin's the best written character in the show. Like, out of everybody. Even Grandpa Max. I feel like they put the most work into giving him layers. And he's also the most comedic. And he has a great dynamic with every other main character. Ben, we already know, flip-flops his personality. Max is very reduced from his once great stance to the show. To where almost all of his dialogue is just filler exposition. And Gwen's starting to become a hit or miss as well. But I really think there's a lot of care put into Kevin's character. Or at least... He's the hardest one for them to screw up. Hit him hard! Yeah. I love that Max is here too. <laughs> Those must be some strong lasers, because it's not often we see things pierce Kevin's armor anymore. I feel like it used to be brittle, but lately it's always durable. Perhaps it's the tachyon technology. <laughs> Hey, that's such a cool move, especially started it off with a front flip. She's just showing off now. This transformation right here is kind of breaking the pace of the episode, not gonna lie. It felt like we were just in the middle of an intense action scene, and then this. Wow, this weapon's so heavy that they need a tripod for it. 
Oh, Max is also using the same kind of weapon we saw the plumbers use earlier. And the texturing of the laser blast is very similar to Rad's electricity infused. What the fuck is this? I think this is a really neat power, but I think this is stretching the magnetic manipulation too far to the point where this is like a secondary power. I like it though, you know, he doesn't just have to be the magnet man. I feel like something like this is a little bit past just magnetism. It's also interesting that the effect starts off as blue when it's just freeing electricity, but then it turns into a green sphere. I don't know if the pixely texture is on purpose or not. The way he's running through is like he unlocked the invincibility cheat. So Lodestar can either fly now, or he's magnetizing himself to the ship and using that to levitate him. I'm alright with him flying, but I feel like the second explanation would be cooler. It's a trap! I remember this being one of the coolest looking explosions in the show. I love the little pieces of fireworks going away. And if you look right here, you can see a small clump of birds flying off. It's very hard to see though. And then a fire afterwards. <laughs> Oh, I wonder if they're gonna get sued from whoever's in charge of this forest. This wisp going off of the shield looks really good. I love the little chunks of debris bouncing around. Oh no! Of course Ben's fine. These little magnets look a little weird without any contact shadow. But this is yet another new powerful lodestar, although it's subtly foreshadowed in his transformation sequence when you see him do a similar thing. He starts transforming back before he's even done collecting himself. Oh wait, no, that wasn't a transforming back. There's just a green transformation flash. I feel like that was unnecessary and it kind of ruins the morph. How did you... Fucking magnets! How do they work? Well, the, the actual transformation barely even has the ray effect. It just flashes white. Where is Agrigor? Lost Soledad. Of course he's there. Maybe he got the idea to go back there when he captured Rad. And he figured this is a suitable place to set up. Oh, these Greg bots are a lot taller than I thought. It's here. So the way this is set up, I think this is Paradox's actual portal, as he was hunting this down and didn't build it. Bring in the prisoners. It's missing the detailings on the side, though, all of the technology that was in this room. Or they could have cleaned it out, you know? They've been here quite a few times, they might as well start tidying up. Yeah, this is the same room that the military guy was sitting in when he first watched Paradox's experiment. I can't find a trace of them. Ben has inverted emblem colors. Sorry, Ben. You did the best you could. It's strange that she can't sense them when she was able to sense them earlier in this episode. Greg must have done something, I guess. We got company. Is it the freaking Air Force again? And we're back here. You know, I want to say it's neat because it's like the season one finale is coming full circle with the first episode, but this seems totally random. Like, why are they involved right now? The Air Force has assigned me to handle all of the weird stuff. Back in the 50s, the US government made a failed attempt to build time machine. Okay, yeah, it is Paradox's literal time machine. It's also very amusing to see him bring it up as if they don't know. Like, there's no way that he would know that they know, but they already know. So him trying to act like they don't know and tell them that so they know is kind of funny. Someone set off the old security system. Does this mean every time they've gone there, someone set off a security system? What happened with the hybrid? Set up a giant freaking hyperspace jump gate there. Did that set off any alarm? My men can't retake that base. My orders are to destroy it. Guess who? Yeah, involving Colonel Rosen right now still seems pretty random, but I love me some paradox. So let's see where this goes. Where's my- I took it from you. Wow, an actual gun. Maybe it's because it isn't getting fired that they're allowed to show it. Disgusting things. Paradox disliking guns is another attribute to his general homage to Doctor Who. In fact, I believe Dwayne McDuffie has even said that the 10th Doctor was one of his favorites. Agrigor intends to use an entropy pump, the power source of my old time portal. Entropy pump. Well, I found an article on one from 1967. I don't know, maybe I'm looking in the wrong places, but I guess it's just a measurement of randomness from what I gather. I don't know, my research is failing me this time. If you know a little bit more about entropy pumps, let me know down in the comments. All the more reason to bomb the place. Yep, that's America for you. Why don't you just go back in time and destroy the engine or something? Solid question. That's always been a problem in Ben 10 ever since Paradox was first introduced, so I'm glad they're addressing it directly in the show. Traveling in time weakens the fabric of space. The reality in Los Soledad is already paper thin. And I do think, at least in the concept of time travel, that is a pretty valid reason. Where the more you go back in time, or the more you mess with reality in one, like, area in time and space, the weaker it gets. Hence why you can't just keep going back in time in the same area, or change reality too significantly. That could probably be why we never see two Professor Paradoxes in one place, aside from his introductory episode. Because there can't be two of him in one area for too long, because it weakens reality. It's also a concept that I use in 5YL. Thanks for that, Ben 10. A word Kevin, Ethan. Man, first Gwen, now Paradox wants a special talk with Kevin. Things will get worse before they get better, Kevin. Boy, that's life. Try to remember who your friends are. I'm sorry. It must be really tough for Paradox to not be able to tell Kevin directly what's 
going to happen because he knows that Kevin needs to become ultimate in order to defeat Greg, but it's also going to take a heavy toll on Kevin's sanity and relationships. But maybe Paradox's words are going to have some effect on it. Hey, if you're giving out free future advice, I want some. Honestly, I'd probably ask the same thing. Like, nothing too spoilery, but you know, like, I'm going to fall down and break my arm tomorrow. I'd like him to be like, hey, don't walk in that direction. I could tell you not to lean against the chronal randomization barrier, but I know you won't pay attention. Paradox knows how much it isn't worth it that he legitimately tells him the future, and it's going to go right over Ben's head. I love that interaction. And this also shows that this is the paradox that comes from after the season two finale. He's already been through the episodes, The Forge of Creation, and Absolute Power Part 2. I think it'd be interesting to try to put together, like, a chronological timeline of the episodes from Paradox's perspective, and see how the episodes of the series unfold from his point of view. And this place is crawling with Gregobots, kind of reminiscent of the Dean Alien War. The Air Force has pulled the troops back, but they're at our disposal. You know, strangely, I do like how the Air Force is someone involved now. Yeah, it does feel kind of unnecessary, but it does make it feel like there's a bigger connection happening here for all of these events. Not only do the Tennysons have the respect and the help of the Air Force, Earth is starting to get a lot more used to extraterrestrial matters, that they're starting to get more involved with the things going on. Ultimatrix looks really good with all of these glows. We should always look like this. But unlike the Big Chill error where the hologram appeared without the dial popping up, now the dial is already popped up, and when the hologram appears, nothing really changes. I do like the hologram has like a brightness gradient to it now. Fire! It's my boy. <laughs> Yeah, for some reason, Ultimate Swampfire gets the lamest transformation so far. The lines don't seem as, like, intricately thought out as they were for all the other aliens. They're not even touching them right now. There's not a lot of dynamic motion and posing and whatnot. This is cool. He's just burning straight through concrete. I feel like that's a very subtle but neat feat right there. Because he can't just light concrete on fire, but here he goes and he does it. Hmm, Kevin's forming a ball without spikes. This isn't even a mace, just like a, a dumbbell or something. Max is back in action, dodging lasers so fast that the Greg bots shoot themselves. Look at this man go. You can't touch him. Yellow fire for ultimate swamp fire. A lot of different colors happening. I need more time. And now he just has those. Which we've seen with Dr. Animo and the Yeti. A lot of different things falling into place this season. What was the Yeti episode? The Galapagos one? So even if you only watched the highest rated important episodes, you'd still get the introduction to this. So this must have been a contingency plan, because aside from defending the machines, I don't see why he'd ever send them out to fight unless he absolutely had to. But these headbands don't wrap around, they're just placed on top because of their odd head shapes. He also might have these headbands to sedate them when they're inside these tubes, so that they don't try to escape. Also, if they were conscious, it'd probably just get super boring just sitting in those tubes. Guys. These guys are a pretty threatening team now that we've seen what they can do. Bivalvin was able to take on NASA. Andreas can knock down buildings with ease. Pandora can absorb seemingly infinite radiation. Galapagos caused downtown destruction. And Rad was able to go toe to toe with Greg and can read people's thoughts. This is a very powerful bunch. Headbands. Damn, Max is so strong if he could hold back by Valvin like that. Didn't Ben need Ultimate Spire Monkey to take on by Valvin? And here Max is using his own raw strength to slam him against a wall. How did I? Did you just waste by Valvin? Yes, I did, son. And don't think I wouldn't do it to you. Ampere Electricity, one of Ultimate Swampfire's biggest weaknesses, which we'll later see happen in the Forge creation as well, so Ultimate Swampfire can't handle massive amounts of electricity. <laughs> I think this Gwen falling right here is reused from a couple scenes ago. Oh yeah, it's right here when Andrea shakes the ground and flips everyone around. She tucks and rolls and falls right here, and they play the same shot when Pandor shoots her shield, except it's flipped. <sighs> he didn't turn back to Swampfire first. Also, it's interesting to see Rad's arms stay the same length, whether or not Ultimate Swampfire is there. That's the third alien to say something like that. Look like a butterfly, but sting like a stink fly. Look like a butterfly, sting like a... <gasps> this might be a good example at showing Galapagos' immunity to mana. <laughs> That's pretty smart. I love whenever she ricochets her mana like that. Another time I remember her doing that prominently was in the final battle part one. <laughs> Did he get him from behind or something? How did Nanomech manage this? His mouth doesn't move either. It's hard to take you seriously with that voice. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the voice either. I feel like it's funny at first, but then after a while, you're trying to accept this character as part of the scene. It's too distracting. It's over! Surprised Agrigor can even hear him. You can't beat us all! 
Oh, his mouth didn't move here either, but it's just a straight on look at him. That's very noticeable. You can't eat us all. Was he doing absorbing the energy of the time stream or something? Absorbing energy causes insanity. Rise. Told by the powerful to control the weak. So there's a whole Osmosian hierarchy, man. I. I really wish they stayed aliens, honestly. I would have loved to explore the planet more of what their society was like. I don't even care about the make it like classic argument. Osmosians as aliens is just, it's better. It happened to me when I was a kid. It's not a lie. Now Kevin's having traumatic flashbacks to his childhood insanity. It's gotta be rough watching someone helplessly make the same mistake that you do. Somebody should do something about this. Nope, we're just gonna... Watch it happen. I always thought this was really cool though. He's starting to see reality shatter around him because of the unstable entropy pump. Another thing I took inspiration for in 5 way And I'll say that a lot, but I just love incorporating the solid lore from the shows. I feel like it makes the story more solid. <laughs> Oh, that's really cool too. It's animated very nicely. It's almost reminiscent of the scene from All That Glitters. <laughs> Try way big. In this running shot right here, Humongosaur's lips are brown. Are gone. I used to think it was weird that he absorbed the aliens too into nothingness, but it also makes sense because he absorbs matter, energy, and DNA. So if he absorbed all of their essence, then yeah, there wouldn't be anything left. That's because my plan succeeded. I love Greg's voice right here. The aliens are all in me. See him speaking with multiple voices is just so cool. I get why they stopped doing that. It probably would have been complicated to keep up with it as you'd have to record every single thing he ever says multiple times. Cause just doing pitch filters doesn't give the same effect. But at least we get it for this one scene right here. So that's the end of the first season. One thing I've noticed with Ben 10 2 parters is usually only one part, whether it be the first part or the second part does have a straightforward following for what's going to be important to the story. And while the second part is filled with a lot of side questing or filler moments in the episode. And with this being part one to a two-parter, even though it's split between seasons, you can consider this a part one episode and part two would be Map of Infinity, as this does take place like immediately after, where we even get a scene recap of this episode. Things like stopping by Colonel Rosen, the whole Mr. Smoothie scene, and fighting the Andromeda Five with headbands. It just seems like a bunch of things needed to happen to fill up the episode's time, whereas I would have just liked an extended version of the things that were vital to really deep dive into the story of what's happening right now. Because I feel like Greg's biggest weakness is we don't get as much development with his own motive and plans and I feel like trimming the fat here and there would help smooth things over and make him a more memorable and acceptable villain aside from just being powerful and looking cool. But I did like that we saw the culmination of Greg's plan come to fruition. I like that the heroes lost yet again. They're doing a lot of losing in this season but I also think it's a good thing because they've gotten to the point where it feels like everything feels so easily winnable. Even if the characters don't believe they'll win, just the status quo of the show would be like, okay yeah but they'll make it out of this. And so far, Ultimate Aliens making them take the most amount of L's they've ever had. And it really does make you question their efficiency, and if they truly are succeeding in the areas that they do. Although, those alleged filler scenes, there are some great moments to them as well, which is why the characterization in this episode gets a solid 5. While Greg gets the short stick for his own character motivations, we really do deep dive into Kevin's perspective on the matters, and I think that's enough to help carry the emotional weight of the stakes. In fact, the way everybody is reacting to this, Gwen, Ben, Max, paradox. I feel like seeing all the different perspectives and the reactions to the scenarios makes the episode much stronger. The little moment between Gwen and Kevin was nice. The foreshadowing to the Forge of Creation that Paradox gives. And in this context, yeah, the Mr. Smoothie scene is great. We really don't see the trio just hanging around anymore and just being friends and enjoying each other's company. And usually when we do, there's been a lot of tension and arguing between the trio this season. Most of it because of Ben's newfound fame. So when they get a chance to breathe, relax, and enjoy each other, it's nice to see. This episode does have a lot of cool segments and it has a lot of interesting ideas like seeing the trio and Max take on the Andromeda 5 or that scene when Greg is going ultimate and you see reality shattering around him. But I don't know, something about this episode's visuals is just off-putting, like it's dragging its feet through these scenes. And while I feel like the characters and even the story are much stronger points in this episode, the visuals are there just to kind of tell the story. And in the season finale, you're expecting a lot more exciting action and visuals. But this episode just didn't have that season finale presentation. Important 
Resistance is a solid five though, you know, it's got that season finale pass, and this is what everything Greg was trying to do has been leading up to. There's a lot of things that are holding this episode back, but the strongest moment still makes it an extremely great watch, and it hypes you up for season two. Let's take a look at those seasonal charts. Ultimate Alien begins with Ben's identity revealed to the world. This gave a lot of new paths for the writers to take the trio into, along with weaving in the new story arc, and the fact that we're having a story arc in general. It seems that Ultimate Alien was still suffering from the new direction of the last season of Alien Force, but we still got some solid stories out of them. There was a lot of newfound creativity here with Ben's celebrity status to help change things up from the typical, who's gonna be the guy that Ben fights today? And while some of the stories didn't land as well as others, it's still a large improvement from what we got before. After the borderline character assassinations we got from Alien Force Season 3, it's actually nice to see Ultimate Alien's characterization scores be the highest of all the other categories this season. While they're still not perfect and there's still residual inconsistency, you can tell there's a lot more love and care being pushed back into the people we follow throughout the franchise. Aside from the second and third episodes, I'd say we finally achieved a long-term balance for how to handle the aftermath of last season, with a good half of these episodes scoring a perfect 5 in this category. So far, every category has been higher than the last group of charts, and the visuals is no different. New aliens, new skills, new characters, there's a lot of great things going on in Ultimate Alien so far. But with Ultimate Alien being a more direct connection to Alien Force than Alien Force connecting to Classic, it doesn't seem like it wants to try as hard to impress you. And while the show is marketed with the new going Ultimate gimmick, it still is yet to make an impact, and all of the Ultimate scenes don't stand out as much as they should. While the art style may be the same as Alien Force, the animation doesn't feel as polished and well choreographed, but at least it was enough to score 0.6 points higher than last time. With the shortest episode count in one season we've seen so far, it's surprising that this category isn't higher. With literally half as many episodes as last season, you'd think it would have an even greater chance at more vital episodes to the story. But Alien Force Season 3 actually won this one by a hair. Ultimate Alien began with a lot of one-off episodes, and even some story arc-centered episodes don't have the same must-see impact. A 2.8 average is a bit disappointing for the first season. Ironically, this season ties with Alien Force Season 3 for a 3.4 score in entertainment. Ultimate Alien may have more enjoyable episodes in quantity, but in quality, the ones from Alien Force and their concepts were overall better and more engaging, such as Busy Box, Ghost Town, and Con of Wrath. Ultimate Alien's story and characters are definitely improving, but now they need to amp up their engagement as well if they want the show to reach the heights it once had. Overall, Ultimate Alien Season 1 ends with an average score of 16.9, which brings the franchise average down 0.5 points to a 17.5. Ultimate Alien was able to fix a lot of problems caused by Alien Force Season 3, but it still hasn't yet saved the franchise from its downhill production. Surprisingly, the highest rated episode wasn't a season opener or a finale, but the middlemost episode, Escape from Agrigore. We got a few hero times, which is nice, and surprisingly only four wrong aliens. Kevin's car took a few more hits as well, with one of them being shared by the new RB3. We got a fair amount of wrath in this season as well, which is great since he's a fan favorite. But as I've said before, it's disappointing that Ben only went ultimate eight times so far, and a few of them was twice per episode, meaning a fair amount of these stories have nothing to do with the new concept at all. So I got a handful of final thoughts for you. First off, in my last quick review, I actually was incorrect, which was pointed out in the comments. Wrath had two catchphrases said in that one, and the counter should have been doubled up. I've fixed it in my charts, but in the actual video, the counter is still incorrect. Also, I didn't catch this until I was editing, but Greg shouldn't be able to use Paradox's old entropy pump to power his machine, as when we saw Paradox's debut episode, the whole portal and everything in it was sucked away into the time vortex and shouldn't be there anymore. So unless for some reason, reason they built a new one from scratch, this is actually a pretty significant plot hole. Also, this is the first time we see Galapagos use his wind attack without turning into his spinning shape, although this just might be an animation error. Overall, I'm really liking Ultimate Alien so far. It seems like Ben 10 isn't afraid to start telling more solid and serious stories anymore, but still isn't quite on Alien Force 1 or 2's level yet. And as with last week's poll, much to my suspicion, it seems that folks prefer the characters over their actual main episodes, as while the Andromeda 5 favorites are more or less evenly split, Split, when it comes to their episodes, there's a clear fluctuation in quality, and I'm still surprised that Andreas's Fault ranked so high in the second polling. For this week's poll, I'd like to ask y'all what part of Ultimate Alien you're enjoying so far. Exploring Ben's fame, Ultimate Greg's storyline, Ben's new going Ultimate power, or the introduction of the Andromeda 5? Let me know what you think when this video goes live in the community tab. I hope y'all have a fantastic rest of your week, and as always, keep it fizzy.